Hi, welcome to the Distinti New Science Paradigms number two. This is the footprint discovery paradigm. Present scientific thinking exists in a discovery paradigm, and we'll explain what that means. But this paradigm is only valid under conditions where we have complete access to all observ observable phenomenon and the tools to make such observations. In other words, and I'll explain what this means, we have access to all the pieces. When the discovery paradigm is merged with the footprint paradigm, a better representation of scientific reality is achieved. And what do I mean by that? Well, the basic principle of science is discover what something is. And we're going to be using these matchimals, uh, these, it's a child's toy. Uh, when I was a kid, it was called memory. Uh, the more modern version is matchimals. And, you know, when you get two pieces that are alike, like two zebras, you, and we could represent that as a scientific discovery. Let me represent with the little graphic underneath these. In other words, a long time ago, we thought fire was an element. Well, even the definition of element has changed since then, but today we know fire to be a chemical reaction. And so these two matches up. Would be that would be a scientific discovery that fire is a chemical reaction, and we'll be using the matrimals to represent things that are a scientific discovery. And then you have is the Australian dingo really a dog? Well, there's evidence to suggest this this species evolved on its own. Is Pluto a planet? Yada yada yada. Okay, so let me demonstrate the paradigm. Let me let me demonstrate the discovery paradigm using the matrimals. Okay, the way this works is when a science, we're a species that wants to make discoveries and so we believing we have access to all the pieces, we keep you know turning them over until we find ones that match. And you can see in the beginning when we don't know much, it takes a long time before matches are found. I just saw the giraffe. But once we turn pieces over, the remaining pieces are fewer, and therefore the probability that we're going to find uh, a match increases. Okay, but once we make these discoveries, we put them off to the left. or put them off somewhere, it doesn't really matter where they go. I'm cheating, I know. <laughs> I want to get this done, I don't want to make this a big long... Uh, and as you can see as we get closer to the end, the discoveries come quicker and quicker. because there's fewer and fewer options and so the discovery should get quicker and quicker as time goes on. So what we learned from this little demonstration, put the matchimals off to the side, is that the rate of discovery will increase over time without stagnation if and only if we have access to all the pieces. Okay, There are no mistakes in the pairings. There's, there's no mistakes in the pairings. Everything pairs off equally. Okay, and therefore there's, there's no mistakes. There's no anomalies. There's no pieces that don't fit, that, are not, that don't have a counterpart in this thing because we have access to all the pieces. There's no anomalies. Okay, and once a discovery is made, it's put aside and it's never looked at again. There's no reason to because we have access to all the pieces. Had we made a false mistake, Okay, and let's say there was a third, we'd be like, oh crap, you know, there's an excess piece that matches what we got. We've got an ambiguity here. How, how do we resolve this? Okay, but, but because we had already had access to all the pieces, everything was known. If we had this, it would have told us 
hey, there's something more here we don't know. These things are not all the same. There's some difference here we don't know yet. We can't measure yet. We can't detect yet. But we don't have that. We believe because these are, look the same that they are the same. And we believe we have access to all the pieces. There's a lot of assumptions here. Okay. But we need to constrain this discovery paradigm. We need to temper the discovery paradigm with the footprint paradigm to obtain a more realistic understanding of what really goes on. And that way there we can bypass the myths and the bull crap that stagnates present scientific thinking. Well, let me give you the definition of footprint. It's the same definition we had in the previous video. In the distinctly new science paradigm, footprint refers to humanity's footprint in the universe. This includes our physical volume of the universe we have access to. The speed at which we can travel and communicate, which obviously the faster we can travel, the more footprint we're going to have in the universe. Our ability to harness different forms of energy, our ability to manipulate matter. Like, for example, uh, sometimes discovery is made by breaking something. Like smashing two atoms together and seeing what kind of parts fly out. Okay, our footprint includes our capabilities of observation, in other words, our ability to measure and how precise we can measure. And that includes things like telescopes, microscopes, scanners, etc. Let me demonstrate the discovery paradigm again when we constrain it with the footprint paradigm. Okay, I've chosen a subset of the matchimals. And the reason for the subset is to demonstrate that we do not have access to all the pieces. There are things in the universe we do not as yet know, and this represents that. And because we don't have access to all the pieces, we're going to have anomalous pieces that don't fit, that don't, we don't understand. But the problem that we have is because we think we know everything, we believe, oh, this is just a minor thing. It'll fit somewhere when we figure it out, and we're going to ignore this. My friends, this is the best indicator that there's something we don't know. And also, because of our limited ability to measure, some of these things really may not be the same. We may not know that. And let me give you an example. These zebras are not the same. Now, there's two ways we could know that the zebras are not the same. And that is to have another set of zebras that would tell us automatically, well, we have to disambiguate. There's something wrong here. But we don't have these other zebras. And so the only other way we're going to know if these zebras are not the same is for new technology to come forward to show us what the zebras in ways we never saw, saw them before. In other words, to shine new light on the zebras. And that's using ultraviolet light. If I put the ultraviolet light on the zebras, I don't know if you can see it from the camera, but one's glowing red and one's glowing green. I hope you can see that from the camera. Let me see if I can bring it up closer to the camera. Okay, so when you shine a new light of a new discovery on what we thought we knew before, we're going to find that certain things that we thought were the same aren't the same. And I'm going to give you analogies of both the anomalous and the false discovery in the next pages. Let me give you an example of when we have a limited footprint, which includes limited technology and limited understanding and limited access to other pieces of the puzzle. In the, in the mid-1800s, our footprint did not include knowledge of nuclear power. We were missing this piece of the puzzle. But our, our, our knowledge did include fire. And as the old saying goes, if all you have is a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail. And if all you know is fire, then anything that generates heat and light must be combustion. And sure enough, we thought that the sun was a big burning ball of coal. A long time ago, we thought trout, rainbow trout was a trout because these are both freshwater fish. It wasn't until DNA testing shined new light that we learned that rainbow trout is actually salmon. Probably salmon that got cut off from being able to return to the sea and it changed itself to live its life completely in a freshwater situation. From the previous video, we learned of the gateway feedback paradigm. And again, here, by shining new light, by feeding back the new tool of DNA, testing. We shine new light on many species to reveal wrong classifications, etc. Again, by feeding back atomic theory, we shine new light on many anomalies that had once wrongly characterized. So we have to feed back new scientific discoveries and look at old stuff in the new light of the new discoveries and the new ways 
to, to verify that there's no mistakes made in the past. And there's even, we still have to feed back, even these new paradigms were developed from the rules of acquisition. While working on the rules of acquisition, I realized there needed to be paradigms to go with them. And by working on these, I actually turned around and improved the rules of acquisition. And we're going to be reissuing the rule of acquisition 1 and 2 in light of the new paradigm series. And we should always cast new light on the old ways to see if things look the same. But here's a caution. Just because we're able to show that an old characterization was bad does not mean that the new characterization is irrefutable. Like, for example, scientists now believe that the sun's energy comes primarily from fusion. Again, if the most powerful thing we know that generates light and heat is nuclear power, then of course we're going to deem the sun as nuclear power. We don't know. There may be something else we don't know of, and I'm sure that this too will be wholly or partially discredited when our footprint expands next. And one of the reasons why I can make that statement is because we cannot get self-sustaining fusion to work on the Earth. If we're so good at knowing what's going on in the Sun, why can't we recreate it in a laboratory on Earth? That's the telltale. Okay, and because we have a constrained footprint, we should never assume that any scientific theory is beyond question because we do not have all the pieces of the puzzle. Our constrained footprint does lead to ambiguities where we can fit more than one theory to any given set of measurements. And we're still going to wrongly interpret what we see. For example, the four zebra problem. From the gateway feedback paradigm, we discern that scientific theory should only ever be treated as gateways that enable us to expand our footprint, leading to new discoveries that, when fed back, will hopefully obsolete existing theories. That's scientific progress. And to go back and explain how footprints can lead to, narrow footprints can lead to ambiguities, each one of these functions of x are very different functions of x, but if you only had a narrow view of these functions, and I'm going to show that narrow view around x equal 2, they're going to look like they all produce the same answer. And that's an, another example of where if you have a constrained footprint, a lot of different things can appear to be the same when they're indeed not the same. And this is going to be covered again when we do the polytheorism, which will be the next video. An example. The examples I use again and again. If you have only a limited number of measurements, the blue dots, you can fit a lot of theories to a limited set of measurements, a small footprint. As you expand the number of measurements you have, you're going to have one theory is going to disambiguate above the others. And then consider the idea of the flat earth. Here's a flat earth Albert Einstein. He can only see things in two dimensions. He is, does not have the capability to see the third dimension. This is a, a theoretical thing. People use flatlander stuff all the time. And so if I took a square object, a rectangular object in my world, and I stuck it into his world, it would look like a square. Again, if I took a circular object that had the same width as the square, and I shoved it into his dimension, he's going to say, these things look exactly the same. He's not going to be able to tell the difference. He does not have the capability to see that these are not the same. Using this as an example again. And so his limited footprint does not allow him to disambiguate the two differences of the shapes. And we have to project that with us. Because we have a limited footprint in the universe. There's going to be a lot of things we're going to misidentify. And we have to be prepared for that. And we have to look for the little anomalies that tell us that we don't have all the answers instead of ignoring them like we do. Here's another thing. If I had a flashlight that emanated yellow light of a single frequency yellow light, another flashlight that emanated green light of a single frequency and red light of a single frequency, and I took the red and the green light and overlapped them, you would see yellow here. That is not, that is, my friends, that is a trick of your eye. That is a flaw of your eye. Your eye can't see the frequency yellow. Okay, you really can't. It, your eye can see the green and the red, and because the yellow is halfway between, your brain bakes the false color out of equal amounts of green and red. That is something your brain does. Okay, you don't actually see yellow. You could, yellow to your brain can either be two frequencies 
of red, it could be two frequencies mixed together or the single frequency, your eye responds the same to both. These are very different, very, very different phenomena. Well, not very different, but they are different phenomena. But your, your eye sees them as the same. And your brain gives you the idea, sense of the false color, I believe. Uh, again, well, the zebra problem, I was going to demonstrate, I demonstrated that before. And finally, the odd piece. We had the odd piece from this example over here. This is the key. When we know we have a limited footprint, and we have one piece that doesn't fit, that should be the key to tell us we have a limited footprint and there's more to go. Okay, but the problem that we run into in science is that we falsely believe that we have all the pieces and we believe that this one odd piece, well, okay, we're just going to be able to explain that within the realm of what we already know. And let me give you some examples where that occurs. Back in Galileo's day, or prior to Galileo, only five objects out of the thousands of objects in the night sky did not fit the Earth-centric paradigm, where the Earth is the center of the universe. And so they all believed that Mercury, Venus, the Moon, the Sun, everything revolved around the Earth, including the stars. And it was only these five objects. Okay, you know, why are we going to give up a whole theory, a theory that agrees with the Bible just because of five little objects? Five little objects? Oh, yeah, right, we're going to throw out the whole theory just because of five little objects. Well, when Galileo came, or Copernicus and Galileo together, independently, you know, one fed off the other, uh, Galileo expanded our ability to measure, and measure more precisely. He expanded our footprint, expanded our capability. And because he did that, he was able to show that the planets, these wanderers, actually revolve around the sun, so do we. And those five little anomalies, those tiny things that we wanted to ignore, caused a paradigm shift, a massive shift in our understanding of the universe. Dark matter. If it can't be found, if there is no dark matter, if we one day come and say, oh gee, there's no dark matter, that means most of our present theory about the universe and how gravity works, which includes relativity, is wrong. But because it generally believed that relativity is irrefutable, not much effort is spent looking for the dark matter. They think, ah, oh, we'll find it someday. Let's not pay attention. We'll eventually figure it out. It's no big deal. We're arrogant. We think we know everything. So the lesson to be learned. Rule of acquisition 2B, beware, the smallest anomaly can be the harbinger of catastrophic change. And the reason why that's true is because theories are crafted to explain the big details or the bulk of the details. And let me take this example here. These are our observations. And we're going to pick a square that fits them because that's what it looks like. And we're like, okay, well, this one's a little bit out of whack. Tiny little bit out of whack. Just a little anomaly. It's not a big deal. Yeah, it's probably just a measurement error. We're going to explain it away 13 ways till Tuesday. And they, we're going to be sure that when we finally explain that little anomaly, it's a little bit off, that, that we're going to explain it within the, 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 the realm of the theory of the square. When in fact, if we do our due diligence and figure out why that little guy is off, we're going to find that it's actually the star that fits those observations the best. And so that tiny little anomaly can be the harbinger of catastrophic change and change our theory drastically. And that may not be the end. Okay, because we have a tiny footprint, we can expect that most of what we know is probably wrong. But useful as gateway models using the gateway feedback paradigm. We need to stop treating widely held theories, uh, example is relativity and quantum, as foregone conclusions. Instead, scientific progress, expanding our footprint, is better served if we train all of our research efforts into whatever anomalies, odd pieces, exist in our current footprint. And that would include things like dark matter, high altitude sprites, yada, 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 with the hope that existing theories will be superseded and fed back. Okay, we should look forward to disproving what we think we know. That is scientific progress. Holding on steadfastly to what we know is not scientific progress. And in the words of Emir Lakatos, blind commitment to a theory is not an intellectual virtue, it's an intellectual crime.
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. This was the Discovery Footprint Paradigm. Thank you.